Mark Rosengarten. Welcome to... Ask Rosengarten. Hey guys, welcome back. Today's question comes to us from YouTube member Besser94. He writes, Would you maybe be able to do a video on phases and phase changes? I'm really confused on the heating curves and where the heat of vaporization and heat of fusion on the graphs, etc. Thanks so much for doing these videos. Aw, you're welcome. I enjoy doing them. That's why I do them. Plus, you know, they help. So what I've got set up right here is a blank heating curve. What it's going to graph is what happens to the temperature of a sample of substance over time as I add heat to it at a regular rate let's say 1,000 joules a minute or 10,000 joules per minute. It doesn't really matter. The idea is we're gonna start with a substance in the solid phase. The substance I'm gonna choose is water because it has very recognizable melting and boiling points. Water melts at 273 Kelvin and boils at 373 Kelvin. Those are the levels to look out for. So, let's suppose we start with ice at a temperature that's less than the freezing point of water. At this point, well, ice is a solid, as you know if you've ever fall down and hit your head on it. It's hard. It hurts, because it's a solid. Now, let's say we start down here. As you add heat to ice, the temperature of the ice begins to rise. Now, it may not seem like it because ice is ice is ice is ice. It's cold. It's really cold. So what difference does it make if it's like, you know, really cold or just cold? Okay, human experience doesn't really help us here. What you do is you stick a thermometer into it, and as you add heat, you record the temperature every so often. So as you add heat to ice, its temperature will rise continuously. And as long as you add heat at a steady rate, that temperature increase will be steady. Why? Because water ice absorbs heat at the rate of 2.09 joules per gram degree Celsius. It has a specific heat that's half as much as liquid water. It takes 2.09 joules to heat up one gram of water solid by one degree Celsius. This process continues until you hit the melting point. At this point, water is a solid. Once you hit the melting point, though, something amazing happens. When you get to the melting point, the substance begins to melt. The solid phase and the liquid phase will be in equilibrium with each other as the solid melts. Now, if you increase to keep adding heat, that tilts the equilibrium in favor of melting. So the substance will melt. And while the melting process is going on, you have solid and liquid together at the same time. When you first start melting, you don't have any liquid. But gradually, as you melt the solid, the amount of solid you have goes down, while the amount of liquid you have goes up, because the solid is melting and turning into a liquid. Well, temperature remains constant while this is going on. Now, the reason behind this has to do with enthalpy and entropy and favored reactions and, and, and uh, Gibbs free energy, but we're not going to worry about that. I'll give you the simple, simple explanation here, okay? The simple explanation is you cannot have solid above the freezing point. You, solid just doesn't exist above the freezing point, and liquid doesn't exist below the freezing point. So while you're at the freezing point, while you have both solid and liquid, it must remain at the freezing point until every last bit of solid has turned into liquid. At that point, as we continue to add heat, the temperature can rise. Now this is not exactly to scale. The slope for this should only be half as much as the slope for this. However, we're going to run out of space if I do that. Liquid water. Liquid water absorbs heat at the rate of 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. So liquid water heats up twice as slowly as solid water does. In other words, if it took 10 minutes to raise the temperature of ice by 10 degrees, 10 minutes to raise temperature of ice by 10 degrees, it's going to take 20 minutes to raise liquid water by 10 degrees because liquid water heats up half as fast as solid water. Well, the temperature continues to rise until you get to the boiling point. 
Now, once at the boiling point, now the liquid starts to form vapor bubbles. Now, you can have vapor bubbles below the boiling point, but the atmospheric pressure squashes those vapor bubbles down. It's like if you sat on a balloon, all right? You just squash the balloon, especially if I sat on a balloon. However, when the vapor pressure of the liquid equals the surrounding pressure in the atmosphere, the bubbles can stay supported and they rise up through the liquid and burst, releasing their vapor out into the air. So the boiling point is the temperature at which the liquid's vapor pressure is equal to the external pressure being put on that liquid. And those vapor bubbles that come up and burst, releasing vapor, that's boiling. You know it's boiling when it goes, it bubbles, right? Now, during the boiling process, you're gonna have both liquid and gas. And just like with melting, you can't have solid above the freezing point or liquid below the freezing point or melting point, they're the same temperature. You can't have liquid above the boiling point and you can't have gas below the boiling point. Well, technically that's not true. You can have water vapor because all liquids evaporate to some degree, but we're gonna keep this simple, okay? During the phase change, the temperature remains constant as long as there is any liquid left to boil off. So if you put water on the stove and heat it up to boiling, because you're gonna put some pasta in it. I love pasta, a little fettuccine Alfredo. <laughs> uh, okay, never mind. Um, as long as there's any liquid in there, even if you, you continue to pump heat into it, pump heat into it, you can hit it with a blowtorch, you can hit it with a plasma torch. It's not gonna matter. The water will not get above the boiling point until every last drop of liquid has boiled away. Now, once every last drop of water has boiled away, then the gas, as heat is being added, can increase in temperature. Water vapor has the same specific heat as solid water, 2.09 joules per gram degree Celsius. So that's where the phases are. What about the heats? Well, in order to turn a solid into a liquid, you have to add heat. I mean, turn on your rear defroster on your car on any winter morning, and it's gonna take time for those little electric wires in the back window to heat up the glass enough to melt the ice and get rid of it. So the amount of heat that you add in order to get the ice to turn into liquid water is called the heat of fusion. And for water, that's 334 joules per gram. Oh, the heat of fusion of water is something very nice. Take away 334 joules per gram and what you get is ice. Hey, same thing goes for boiling. You can't boil water unless you continue to add heat to it, right? Now the temperature's not changing during the phase change, but that doesn't mean you're not still adding heat. The heat you add to boil off the liquid is called the heat of vaporization. For water, this is 2,260 joules per gram. So technically, this line should be much longer than this line right here. 334 joules per gram, 2,260 joules per gram. This line should be like eight times longer. But again, I'm, I'm under constraints here because I have just a small board. Now, while the temperature is changing, that means that kinetic energy is being changed. You're adding heat to your substance and kinetic energy is changing. Why? Because temperature measures average kinetic energy. So if the temperature's going up, that means the kinetic energy's going up. So during the diagonal portions of this curve, kinetic energy increases. What about potential energy? Well, potential energy stays the same. You're adding heat from an outside source. While the temperature is changing, the energy you're putting into it is going into making the kinetic energy change. However, during the phase change, when temperature doesn't change, right, kinetic energy is remaining constant, well, you're still adding heat, and if it's not kinetic energy that's changing, it's potential energy that's changing. That's why heat of fusion and heat of vaporization are measured in joules per gram. Joules, 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 joules. A unit of potential energy, because during a phase change, the potential energy is changing. What potential energy? Well, you're adding potential energy to break the attractive forces between the molecules, to separate them. So that's basically what's going on here during a heating curve. During a cooling curve, you just reverse this process. All the steps go down. Gas, condensing, liquid, freezing, 
and then solid. Heat of vaporization, instead of being added to boil it, will be removed to condense it. Here, my glasses are going to remove some heat of vaporization. Ready? You see, my water vapor turned into liquid water droplets on my glasses. Okay, I can't see. And when you get down to the freezing point, you remove heat of fusion. I mean, you've put ice cubes in the freezer, right? Well, no, you don't put ice cubes in the freezer. You put water in the freezer, and the freezer turns them into ice cubes. How? Well, the temperature of the freezer is colder than the temperature of the water that you put in there. So the heat will flow from the water into the freezer. As energy is removed from the water, it gets down to the freezing point, it freezes and then turns into ice cubes, which you can put in your drink and enjoy a really nice cold drink on a hot summer day. Oh my goodness, I wish it was a nice hot summer day. I am so sick of this winter! Now, if you have any additional questions, like for example, if any of you have any questions as to the whole enthalpy, entropy business as, a, as to why 273 Kelvin is the melting point of water and why 373 is the boiling point of water from an entropy and enthalpy standpoint, a Gibbs free energy standpoint, just let me know and I'll be happy to do a video on that because that's always a tremendous amount of fun. Now I've been taking a lot of the questions you've been asking me as comments on my other videos and forwarding them on to my other email address. You can contact me directly at askrosengarten at gmail.com and I will get to your question. This is a great question today. They're always great questions. They're, the only bad question is the question that you don't ask. So, what are you waiting for? Ask Rosengarten.